Well, after Philo of Alexandria, we get another guy. This time, it's a Christian theologian, and his name is Origen. We still have his works, fortunately, because the church had them banned and burned. And it had to do with, I think he eventually went to this place where he believed all creation would be redeemed, including Satan himself. That after, who knows, billions of years of punishment in hell, Satan would finally repent and God's mercy would even extend to him and he would be reconciled as an angel of light. And because of that, he, the, the church said, no, we don't want it, we don't need it, you're out. But they did keep his method of interpretation for even to this day. And he adopted Philo's allegorical interpretation and he applied it to both the Old and New Testament. And this became the standard all the way up until the Protestant Reformation, where you have this literal historical being pushed and infused by people like Luther, Calvin, Melanchthon, etc. With allegorical interpretation, though, it treats the scriptures kind of like an onion. Okay. So the scriptures become either like an onion or an ogre or a parfait because they have lots of and lots of layers. <clears throat> and so the art of interpretation now becomes how do you get into these deeper and deeper layers of the truth? Because for the unregenerate mind, if you come to this outer layer, it's going to be brown, dirty, tough, hard to get through. And that's how the scriptures are to those without the Holy Spirit within them. Yeah, they may be able to take some poetry or some history or some pithy little sayings, but they're not really getting the meat or the deep truth. But once the Holy Spirit illumines you, you begin to get to see deeper and deeper into the meaning of the passage until hopefully you're finally illuminated to its truest and most inner depths. Does anyone know what a type is in the Bible? Uh, so it's like a representation of a New Testament character like in the Old Testament, right? So like uh, Joshua is a type of Christ in the Old Testament. Good. Like a foreshadowing uh -huh. or something of that nature. And so we see lots of types in the Bible. And this is something literal, historical, grammatical people would agree with as well as <coughs> allegorical. This. Let me give you an example. So we have the children of Israel are being naughty in the desert and God sends serpents to bite and afflict and even kill them. And they plead for mercy, they repent, and God tells Moses, I want you to make a bronze serpent and put it upon a staff, and anyone that looks upon that will be healed. Okay. That was a literal, historical bronze serpent on a real staff by a real historical figure healing real people. But it was also a type or a foreshadowing of Christ who would be lifted up to redeem and save the people. So that's what we're talking about with types. It still really happened, so there would still be a literal historical Adam and Eve, but they would have symbolism or meaning or taught pointing to the future well beyond their own individual role. Uh, another great example would be when Abraham was told to <coughs> offer Isaac and God provided a ram. It's acknowledging a real historical Abraham, a real Isaac, and a real flesh and blood ram. But that ram is a type of Christ who would be given in exchange for us to cover God's justice, his holiness. In it, do any of you go to churches where this method is used? The only time that gets used at my church is when I'm preaching. <laughs> my church is all about exegesis. It's where you look at the original languages, you look at the context, you look at culture norms and values, you look at the totality of scripture to try to extract from what's in that passage to see what God is trying to tell you. When I went to school in the Deep South, however, that was a rare type of sermon. They were almost all allegorical. And it was usually types. They, were, they weren't saying there wasn't a historical Garden of Eden or a historical flood, but they are also seeing it and focusing on the types. 
And one of the best sermons I ever heard about this was, it's in Joshua, the day he commanded the sun to stand still. And if you remember that passage, I believe it was five kings of the Canaanites had made a, a collaboration to try to ward off these Hebrews coming into the land. And God told them to kill every last one of them. It was one of those genocidal movements. This wasn't just take captive, sell them. Away. It was full annihilation. And these kings, the battle was going poorly, and they ran into a cave to, to hide. But instead of going into the cave to kill them, they rolled a boulder in front of the cave to keep them in there. And at, at the school back east, this was the, the text one, one chapel, and the preacher read the text, he closed his Bible, and then he said, what kings do you have hidden in the caves of your heart? And I was just like, holy cow, it was just this safe historical story, and now it's really personal. He's like, do you have the king of lust, of pride, of self-righteousness? And do you go down and feed them dainty little morsels just enough to keep them alive? And I'm just thinking, wow, this is so intense. And so he took this passage, which I always saw as a historical narrative, and now all of a sudden he's giving this deep spiritual meaning, like we need to obey God not keep these little vices, these kings of our life alive. And, you know, we keep them cap captive, but we also keep them alive. And I was so excited that when my church finally got to the point to exegete this passage here in California, I asked, could I do that passage? I know this great sermon for it. But as I'm doing the study, if you read the rest of the passage, the Hebrews come back the same day, unroll the stones, go in, and kill every last one of them. And I'm just like, gee whiz, what is going on here? So what's the problem? Or is there a problem? It's creative writing. I mean, if you take these random stories and apply it to your own preaching however you want. I mean, right. What limits you? Your own imagination, basically. Now, could there be spiritual, allegorical interpretation? I would assume so. I mean, we see Paul using it in different times or applications, right? Like talking about support of people working for the gospel or for the church. He quotes, you shall not muzzle the ox. That was a literal muzzle on a literal ox um, grinding literal grain. But Paul took that and applied it to something practical and pertinent to humans and the church. Now, most people that are in this type of hermeneutic are actually fine with allegorical application. Where they get upset is if you do allegorical interpretation. Because the allegorical interpretation is actually saying the scriptures are saying something different than what a literal historical would say it's actually saying. Does that help make sense? I mean, I like the effort, I like the imagery, but that is the problem with allegorical interpretation. You literally can make the scripture say what you want if you allegorize it. And so now we have theistic evolutionists who allegorize the scripture, but not because of God's power and he could have created it in an instant, but like, well, God probably took billions of years, but he put it in a way we could comprehend at a human level. And so you can see allegory could make it six seconds or six billion years at the drop of the hat. There's nothing to limit that sort of thing except your own spirituality. Last critique I have of this, and don't get me wrong, I think there's a place for this interpretation. I think you even see, like I said, the apostles and others using that type of interpretation. But you can also get into this spiritual one-upmanship. So someone might come in and preach on John 6 or something, and you can say, oh, brother, that was great. You picked out some really good things that we could apply to our life, but keep studying, you know. Maybe God will show you the deeper meaning next time. And then maybe when you get to preach the passage, you can show them the deep, deep, deep teachings that the Spirit has illumined to you as it's pulled away all these layers. And that, that just becomes silly to me when it becomes this like, well, if you really, really knew the passage, or if you really unpacked it, or if you really got to the core of the truth, then you would understand. And enough of that. 
Any other questions, comments on that stuff? Oh, one last little note on origin. And if this is an irony, I don't know what is. The passage that says, if your right eye offend thee, pluck it out. If your right hand offend you, cut it off. For it's better to enter into the kingdom blind and lame than to be cast into hell whole. Well, if anything's going to be taken allegorically, I would do that passage, yeah. right? Yeah. He took it literally, and he cut off his own genitalia because it was causing him grief, and he didn't want it to keep him out of the kingdom of heaven. So he was a self-made eunuch taking the scriptural literally. And so, I don't know, I just think that's interesting. It helped in his ministry, though, because people were very comfortable with him visiting the widows and ladies of the churches because they knew nothing was going to happen.